We're so privileged. It's such a privilege to be able to get up every day. And, you know, I'm a sales guy at my heart. And, um, you know, it's not often that you get to sell something that is actually meaningful and hopefully moves the dial uh, for families and, and, and people. Just a quick reminder for you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari. Welcome to another episode of the Made in America podcast. Today, I have Joe Mullally, Senior Vice President of DeFibTech. Joe, thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, my pleasure, Ari. Thanks for having us. It's my pleasure to have you on, Joe, and it's the Made in America podcast. So we start off with the same two questions. What do you make and why do you make it? Okay, well, the first one is easy to answer. We make defibrillators, as you can see here. I brought one along to show you. And we also make... Which we hope we don't have to use on the show. Yeah, let's hope. Right. Uh, let's hope nothing too shocking. <laughs> right? um, we also make an automated chest compression device, which gives an automated CPR. And why do we make it? Because we passionately care about the epidemic in this country of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. The equivalent of two jumbo jets a day go down in the United States and uh, we want to deploy as much product as we can to help those families that, that get impacted by it. Listen, it's a really, really uh, noble mission and obviously a really, really interesting product. So let's maybe unpack a little bit about how DefibTech got into the defibrillator business. I mean, actually, maybe even before that, just let me talk about what the defibrillator is. I mean, I think people have sort of probably remember and have seen sort of those in the hospital, the two metal panels, they rub them together, sure. clear, you know, and sort of yeah. throw it on. Um, and is that what we're doing here with this thing? Well, it, the, we, we manufacture two types. We have a pre-hospital product, which is a little like that. And we have what's in front of us today, which is the public access. And it's much more simple than that. I mean, really, the, the, the unit or device will walk you through a rescue. That's what it's designed to do. So things like very clear enunciation of instruction when you put it on. You can see it's not an intimidating looking product. I mean, that's by design. It's it's uh, it's high visibility and, it, and it's 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 there to try and, uh, you know, minimize the the normal trepidation that somebody would have in a rescue. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for people that are listening to the podcast and don't watch the video, like I typically do, I don't know, it's the about the size of an old like cassette recorder with a handle on it. It's got like a bright, you know, yellow look to it and some pretty like clear, simple buttons on it. And so what you're telling me is this is going to walk me through shocking somebody's heart back into action. Or not shocking it. That's the thing. Or not shocking it. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that people get concerned about. You know, with an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, when somebody goes down, they're essentially dead. And so that normal fear that we would have that I'm going to injure somebody, we are not. And the product's designed, obviously, to detect whether the heart is in the rhythm that would require shocking. So it's it's you're not going to hurt somebody who's who's not, and you you can really only save somebody. So the machine itself is going to take the guesswork out of it. Exactly. There's, it, 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 that's what it does. It, it, it reads the rhythm and makes a call for you. So let's go kind of back to the beginning. How did DefibTech get started in, in general and into this market? Yeah. Well, so I've been with DefibTech since 2018. The company was started in 1999 by two uh, college friends from Yale, uh, Glenn Loeb, who was a cardiac surgeon or cardiothoracic surgeon, and Gintris Varinthis, who was the uh, his classmate. And the story that I had heard anecdotally was that um, Glenn was in his office and somebody approached him to sell him a defibrillator and it was a hellacious amount of money. And he called Gintris and said, hey, Gintris, you're a smart guy. We should disrupt this market. And they did. And really, that's how... DefibTech came into being, and the value proposition was it was much more accessible for ordinary people and ordinary businesses to be able to afford. It wasn't a high, you know, value. I mean, obviously they're expensive, but it wasn't, you know, beyond reach. So 
prior to this product being invented, were there sort of defibrillators? Like, every, I mean, for people who maybe don't, now we have one in our building. And, and so you, once you get one, I think you sort of, as a lot of things happen, you know, you, you buy a new car, all of a sudden you see other people driving that car. You don't see anyone who's pregnant. Your wife gets pregnant. You see pregnant people everywhere. So you buy the defibrillator. And now, you know, when I go places, like I see the sign, you know, there's just like a little thing before this product, were there defibrillators kind of in public office buildings? Yeah, for sure. There, there were. were. I mean, but probably, I mean, obviously every year deployments get bigger, health and safety legislation, government mandates, education, they drive, you know, a lot of this. And really those are the two critical things for our business. It's education and legislation. That's what drive it. So they decide to make the product. How long from 1999, you know, hey, let's do it before the product launches? Well, so the VIEW product, I believe, launched in 2000. And, uh, sorry, the Lifeline product launched in uh, very soon after the establishment, 1999. And then VIEW was some years after. So I think I think Lifeline was 20, 2001 and VIEW was around about 2004. Six, I think. Don't hold me. To what is that. it? What is the? I don't know. What is Lifeline? What's so view? Lifeline is is how we demark the entry level product, and the view is the. Same. Oh, this is the light. What's well, yeah, this Lifeline right on it? I guess if I would just open my eyes and read, Joe, I'd go yeah, get a long no, way. I, I want this to go well, so I'm <laughs> trying to be a good a good guest. But also, there'd be a. a a small screen on the view, therefore the name view, you so you can look at it. So it's just another point to make it easier in a rescue situation that you can see an animation of how the rescue should go, where you position the pads, etc. So the business gets started and you're saying it's education and legislation. So how hard is it to get sort of this ramped up to where people are educated or there is enough legislation where people understand where they should have this product? Well, so penetrate, it's funny. I talked to one of our business partners on Monday and we think market penetration is about 30%. So we're still got a long way to go. I mean, every school, um, you know, we recently uh, spearheaded working with Congress, um, the AED, to access to AED bills, which mandates that schools have AEDs. I mean, you would think, right, every school would have an AED in it. Well, there's 31 states where they don't have to. So that's the kind of thing that we need to we need to drive as an industry. And it's really important. I mean, we take we take that as importantly as anything else. And one of the things that I really like culturally about DefibTech is when we do work like that, we consider that work for the greater good. I mean, we don't get bills earmarked for only DefibTech product. We get it for everybody. And, you know, what's the best AD? The one that's there, the one that works, the one that saves a life. I mean, of course, we always would like it to be ours, but, you know, any AD is a good AD. And so what's sort of the go-to-market strategy that you guys have been doing to kind of get the products into the hands of people who can actually save a life when the time comes? Yeah, so that's a great question. Basically, we work exclusively through distributors. Um, and they're generally really specialized houses who add a lot of value that we can't. So we have small amount of strategic partners who add in additional value to us. So they can provide training. They can provide additional things like cabinets, um, you know, pr program management, which is where you have the defibrillator deployed and you don't have to worry about anything other than if you use it in a rescue. So... Talk to me a little bit about the training and the use. Like, I guess I, I think I look at a product like this and I think to myself, the fear of using it's got to be high, right? I mean, I you're, you're in a very stressful situation, probably somebody you know or a very dear loved one probably collapsed, right? I would imagine they're probably not talking or anything right. um, and you got to do it. So is there is there a hurdle to cross to sort of get the general public to feel comfortable going in the box and, and getting it done? Well, so we're seeing a lot of great initiatives and we one of the things that we've invested in is a community uh, outreach manager and it's a guy called Mike Papali. He's quite well known within um, within Connecticut. You, sure, I'm, I've seen him many a time. At last time at night on WTNH talking about defibrillation. He's also the president of In a Heartbeat Foundation and a survivor of an out of hospital cardiac arrest. So Mike does a lot of work with the high schools and the youth clubs and the basketball to get training as part of the curriculum. Um, and that's really it's as simple as that. I mean, it's like anything. You know, the more you practice it, the less intimidating it is and um you know 
I, I can only imagine what it's like. I've never run a rescue. We had a colleague who worked with us who did, and he had been around defibrillators for 12 years. Somebody collapsed in his church in North Haven, and he ran a rescue, and he said, man, it, that, was, that was stressful. Yeah. But, he, but, you know, with all of the training that he had given and received. So that's why the, you know, the having legislation and educating people, um, because, you know, we see the flip side of it. And that's what motivates us every day. You know, um, we see the survivors. We're really connected with a lot of those nonprofits. And it's really heart wrenching. It's people who've lost a, a son, a daughter, a mother, a father. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you my own story because it's, it's, it's a small aside, but it's very typical of people who are into fib tech. I had been part of a small medical device company that had exited, and I was looking forward to having some time off. My wife certainly was not looking forward to me having some time off. And a good friend of mine called me and said, hey, there's this great company in Guilford, Connecticut with manufacturing in Bramford. I, by the way, I live in Madison and I have a fortunate enough to have a two and a half mile commute to work. <laughs> which is, you know, another thing I love about it. But, um, and so I came to meet with Kei Yoshizawa, who was the uh, Neon Coden um, liaison uh, COO of the company. And we really hit it off and I liked him, but I still wasn't really sure that I wanted to go back into the workforce that quickly. And my eldest brother, who was 64, uh, Donald Mullally, um, was about a year away from retirement. And he collapsed in his house in Horbury in Wakefield. And his wife found him the next morning when she came back from work. So for me, it was very personal. And we don't talk a lot about mission at the FibTech. We try to live it. Um, and I think we do a decent job at it. I mean, w w for the company the size we are, I'm very proud of our accomplishments with uh, legislation. I'm super proud of what Mike Papali and our marketing team do. And really all of our employees are given the opportunity to gift a defibrillator every year. And we try to drive that so they can give it to their church, their lo local youth club, you know, whatever they want. And uh, every employee in our company has a defibrillator after they get trained. Wow. Talk about really making a, a lasting uh, a lasting impact, and it sounds like your personal experience kind of drove your own personal mission right into the the fib tech family. Yeah, I think it was serendipity for sure, and and I think that's what's special about this industry. We're so privileged; it's such a privilege to be able to get up every day. And you know, I'm a sales guy at my heart, and um, you know, it's not often that you get to sell something that is actually meaningful and hopefully moves the dial. Uh, for families and, and, and people. So what did you do leading up to your time at DefibTech? What was the, what was the Joe Mullally story uh, before 2018? So Joe Mullally was a humble immigrant who <laughs> came to uh, Connecticut in uh, 1994. Admittedly, I did talk my way into an upgrade with Virgin. So okay. It wasn't quite steerage class, but it was nonetheless. And I, I came to work for Sango Ban. Um, I'm sure it's the biggest company nobody ever heard of. And hey, it's not their podcast. So I'm sorry I gave you 17 years of my life. Yeah. Um, so at Sangoban, they they have brands like Certainty. Uh, it's a French it's, conglomerate, it is, right? They've done yeah, a lot of manufacturing yeah. conglomerate. So so I, I came over initially a, as a role in marketing, and then I decided I wanted to do something more honest. So I went into sales, and um, I was a sales manager for them, and really went through the sales organization. I, I was running their. A national distribution portfolio, which was pretty significant uh, before I left to um, go to IDEX, uh, which is a, another a kind of in the medical space. Uh, I And then I was so fortunate I had the opportunity to uh, be a venture partner in a very small startup, which I took from zero sales to more than zero sales. <laughs> so what was the name of the startup? It's called Vascular Insights. And what was the what was the product? Or? The product was basically a way of treating varicose veins. So you know the traditional method is you burn them out, tear them out. Um, Seriously? All, yeah, really horrible. And we developed uh, with the help of a very smart Israeli interventional radiologist guy called Michael Tal, um, a pharma mechanical device, which um, meant that you didn't have to use anesthesia, tumescent anesthesia. So when you ha either have them burnt out or pulled out, you either go under general anesthesia or you get tumescence. They put the tumescence in between the fascia and the vessel so you don't feel it. 
and our, you have really no nerves in the inside of your veins. So as we would ablate the veins using a pharma mechanical, you wouldn't feel anything and you'd be able to have a day procedure, leave and go the next day. So that was pretty exciting. And yeah. you know, the interesting thing with innovation, and I'm sure a lot of Connecticut manufacturers, particularly the ones in the medical device space, will understand this. It's very hard to innovate in the United States. The traditional path to commercialize your product is in Europe because the regulatory bar was more friendly to innovation. So the first product we sold was in the Netherlands and we kind of worked backwards. The last market we really entered was the United States. So back that up. So the United States market from a medical device perspective is a challenge to get into. It is, but but in in I have to say in a good way because the FDA really have a very high bar and other countries don't necessarily have such a high bar. What we're beginning to see is in Europe um, where the CE mark was the method of entry. Uh, the, the EU have gotten together and they've said, hey, let's raise our our bar significantly for entry. So now it's like the FDA. And of course, there's a significant cost to a manufacturer to, I mean, that regulatory burden. I mean, it, it, typically for a product uh, to, to, you know, get approval from the FDA, just the FDA fees can be in excess of $300,000. Then you got to hire the consultants to walk you through the process because it's, you know, it's obviously a complicated and difficult one. And the whole point of having a hurdle that high is safety. Exactly. And, and you know, for us at Defintech, that's really, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of is our, our reputation for reliability and quality. So, I mean, you uh, one thing that you and I talked about prior to the thing, to the show, and I think it'd be helpful to explain explain to people is sort of the different classes of devices sure. that the FDA has. And so class one to class three. So just maybe walk through, you know, what, what that means, right? So, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit here about the FDA, whose job it is, I think, really right to make sure that the products that come to market are safe for human, for human use. And that could be something that you ingest or something that you use as a device. So just walk us through the sure. class of so device. Class one device is, can be something like a syringe. A syringe is a class one device, lowly regulated, generally fairly widely available. A class two is... Can I ask a question as we course, go? Yeah. It, it feels like a syringe is like a pretty invasive device, but it's but but it's only a class one because it's like pretty basic. And I, just, I guess I'm just, the logic well, I, escapes I, I, me. I, I hate to be difficult, but <laughs> a syringe is only a delivery device. A needle is a fairly invasive device. Oh, so got it. I picked my words carefully. You there, sure I did. A syringe. <laughs> But um, no, a syringe, Got class it. one. Um, I actually don't know what classification a needle is as well, so I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> um, but a class two would be something along the lines of our uh, automated chest compression device. And then a class three is typically something that's implanted in the body. So, you know, you hear of people who have pacemakers mm -hmm. or have... Uh, you know, other implantable devices. Yeah, I've got two metal rods in my back. Okay, right. so... So you know how important it is that, the, yeah. that, the, that those are, are correct in quality. So the burden for entry is a class three, and that's what defibrillators are classified. They're class three. It's the highest form of classification that you can get in with the FDA. And, and it's, you know, one of the brilliant things about DefibTech and one of the things that we're so proud of and that the founders of DefibTech should be very proud of is that um, they established a class three a manufacturing facility in Bramford, Connecticut. And that's a difficult, that's a high bar to pass. That's a really high bar to pass, yeah. Because it just takes, maybe like elaborate a little bit on the, why, why is that so challenging? It's a lot of Irish guys. <laughs> a lot of them. We got a lot of Malalis over there <laughs> making it happen. Lots of L's. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, it, it well, you've really got to have a very robust quality system. You've got to, I mean, it, it's soup to nuts. It's the highest level Um of you know, manufacturing, engineering, quality systems, regulatory, and really been able to demonstrate that in an audit to the to the FDA and in your submission. Yeah, because you've got to have those reliable processes in place because exactly. it's not just about having the product at the end of the day that's going to pass it. You've got to make sure that the, all the steps going into making that product are exactly the same level of quality and reliability that the, to make that end product. Exactly. And so even though there's nothing in a defibrillator that goes into your body other than the electric shock, right? So the, no one has to worry if they use an AED, they don't have to worry about putting anything inside somebody, but it's that shock is what puts this into that class three area. Well, 
Well, it's just about that it's so important that, the, you know, the FDA felt that it was so important that, that these worked and worked when deployed, that that was the decision to, to make that bar. So, so, and I don't, neither of us are doctors, so maybe you don't know this question, but like exactly how does it work? Like what, what's happening to somebody that you need to get a shock to get back into operation here? Well, let me give you it in very broad strokes. If you sure. think of traditionally the difference between a heart attack and a cardiac arrest, a cardiac arrest is electrical and a heart attack typically is a blockage in your arteries, which is plumbing. So in the most simplistic terms, the only way that you can reset the electrical system in your heart is to shock it back into rhythm. And and that's about the entire depth of my knowledge. I apologize if there's a cardiologist. I'm actually the son of a cardiologist and I can see them <laughs> slapping me in the back of the head going, that was terrible. No, that sounds, listen, to me, it sounds pretty good, Joe. So we're going to, so we're going to run with it. So this is totally two different things then. So when someone has a heart attack, that's just due to the fact, to your point, it's just the, pl the pipes are clogged, exactly, which is totally different or than, it could be, you know, you have the underlying condition where you, you know, you have wall yeah. of the heart, right? Or exactly. something like that. Yeah. So defibrillator is not going to help us in that situation. It, it, it might, but it's it's not your first call of call. Of, uh, it's not first port of call. Port call. Gotcha. Yeah. And but otherwise, when you have and so what? So generally, someone would just have like a heart um, would just have like cardiac arrest. It just means somehow the electrical signals in your to your brain to your heart just get jacked. Just well, get. Yeah, and it manifests in that it most likely you collapse, you hit the deck, and it's lights out. I mean, you are, into all intents and purposes, dead. And, and, and that is something I'd like to spend a minute on. Because please. That's why you can't hurt anybody if they've had an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. For anybody listening to this who's ever, uh, God forbid, in this position, but, you know... The, the, the mantra that we try to say is the first thing that you should do in that situation is call 911 or call your local emergency service. Um, then you start to give high quality CPR. You can see on various videos, American Heart Association have demonstrations of, you know, how to give proper uh, CPR. Um, and then also at the same time, when after you've called 911, send somebody to find a defibrillator. I mean, go to the largest big building, go to a supermarket, you know, uh, because the response time, it's typically, and I may be a little off in this, but it's typically under 12 minutes. I mean, they want to get to you within 12 minutes for survival rates. So one of the most common things that happens, and we see this in airports, um, where we see the CCTV footage, people will generally sit and look at somebody who's just had an out of hospital cardiac arrest and really not know what to do. And those initial minutes are critical. So you can, you know, you can talk to them or try to talk to them to get elicit a response. You can tap them on the back quite hard to see if you can get a response. And then if you're not, in all likelihood, they've suffered an out of hospital cardiac arrest. And Will CPR solve that problem? CPR, high quality CPR is a really important part of that. Well, you, you, uh, just to, just knowing that you choose your words very carefully, you keep correcting me saying high quality CPR. What does that mean? So high quality CPR, the CPR you typically see on the television isn't real CPR. I mean, nobody's kind of doing that. <laughs> They're going two inches deep CPR. I mean, generally, I mean, it's not uncommon for um, older people to break lip, ribs or, or even for younger people in that matter. I mean, it's, it, it's a very important stage of resuscitation in a rescue. And, you know, Defib Tech, that's what you asked me about our products and initially, and, and I give you a very brief overview. For us, the future, we believe in making sure that that survival rate increases is more deployment of automated uh, chest compression device. We have a product called the Arm, and it basically delivers a high quality CPR in an automated fashion. Now, you, if you've ever tried CPR and you've done it properly, it's quite a workout. Yeah, it really is. And and of course, the adrenaline of the situation can get you through. But if you're a professional in an ambulance or um, you, you know, it, 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 and that's a dangerous job. You've got two people in an ambulance, one trying to give high quality CPR while the other's rushing you to the hospital, you know, through lights and stuff. A lot of those guys get injured. Hmm. So it's a great solution for the pre-hospital market. We're putting a significant investment into that. Um, we've, we've got a product at the moment. We're doing a big redesign. We just launched it at a major um, show for firefighters. We've had a good response from it. And we're going to build that in Bramford and export it all over the world. 
Do you export the defibrillators around the world? We do. We're in over 40 countries. No kidding. Yep. You traveling around a lot to make sure these defibs are getting in people's hands? I, I do my best. My wife loves it when I'm away. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really important to us. You know, we've these strategic partnerships are just that. Um, you know, we pick our partners and markets very carefully. And so it's, it's important for us to spend face time. And, you know, I enjoy that. I like to look somebody in the eye, shake them in the hand and, and, and talk to them about what their plan is. And moreover, go see their market. You, you can't learn a market. You can't learn your patience if you're not out there. You can't whiteboard your way to success. You know, you got to go out and really understand the market. Yeah, sales doesn't happen from inside your four walls, right? Right. Yeah. So, in the is the is there a receptive market in other countries from a regulatory and educational perspective to kind of embrace defibrillators the way it seems like we started to do here? Well, one of the models is a, f- an, a fantastic market is the Netherlands. They're so advanced. It, and generally, most aspects of healthcare, they really are innovative and they're very community oriented. So, for example, it's not uncommon in the Netherlands for a, a neighborhood to get together, buy a defibrillator and have a plan. And really? Yeah. And so they'll have, you know, they'll have all kinds of like neighborhood watch things. To, to And we see that a lot. It's actually our biggest international market is Netherlands. And we get a particular kick out of that because our very worthy competitors, Philips, that's our home market. <laughs> and um, we, we take a, a lot of their business from our little factory in Connecticut. Oh, there you go. Um, and so the how does the arm work? So it, it actually does the compressions itself. Yeah. So basically there is a piston and a motor and it replicates uh, sure. high quality CPR. And we've got some features in our new product, which we're really excited about. We have active um, compression, which I'm not making any claims here just to be totally clear. Um, but in theory, that should help with perfusion. So um, perfusion, pr- your blood flow in your body. Got it. So the yeah, listen. The guys that, like me pretend to be doctors. <laughs> and you're making that here in Brantford? Yeah, yeah. So we're making that, and w- that's really an upgrade of our original arm. So we're really excited about that. And our parent company, who are very uh, generous to us and very supportive, are really embracing that product and helping us integrate it into their own portfolio products. I think they're pretty excited about it. So talk me about that, because I, I know uh, kind of in prepping for the show that you know, there's a change of ownership kind of into FibTech. It's, it's no longer longer the uh, locally owned startup uh, that it once was, and it sort of graduated beyond that. So where are we on that? And how has that transition been for the company? 2012, the company was acquired by a fantastic Japanese company called Nihon Koden. And Nihon Koden really were started in the 1950s. Their area of specialty is, um, well, product-wise, they're known for patient monitoring, but they've got a great expertise in sensors. And it's been fantastic for DefibTech. I mean, they've been very supportive. They've really, um, Gintra stayed on as the CEO for four years. I mean, they were very, they're very employee centric. They're very patient centric. I mean, they believe in using technology to treat patients. I mean, that that's really their, their core mission. So um, they've helped us with many things from manufacturing processes, as we all know how expert Japanese are in, in that space. Um, but they've been a fantastic partner and they're so employee and patient centric. It, it's really made for a very nice culture. It's been for a good partnership. Uh, Fantastic. Post deal, yeah. continuing to invest in the U.S. Well, uh, yeah, that's exactly it, Ari. I mean, they're they are all. I mean, one of the things that I'm sure was very attractive for them was having a class three medical device. And I know they're chomping at the bit to transfer a product over for us to make in Connecticut, create more Connecticut jobs, and you know, export more product. Nothing wrong with that. No, for sure. Um, how do you guys, I mean, with this type of demand for the level of precision and quality that a class three, you know, device uh, requires, how are you guys sort of addressing the workforce challenge that you must be finding? Because you must need high skilled uh, workers to put this stuff together. Well, for sure. We've been really lucky. We've got a pretty stable workforce in in the factory, many of whom have been with us for a long time. And um, you know, we work very closely with MPI. I don't know if you know MPI. Of course, sure, Manufacturing sure. Pipeline Initiative, and, yeah. And so uh, a lot of those folks, when we transitioned from our Seymour facility to Bramford, they followed us. And I think that's quite a testament for um, the culture. I mean, uh, so that's been a big focus for us and retention and, um, you know, treating people in the right way. That That's really the culture at the FibTech. I mean, y- 
for me, for sure, that's the, the thing that I enjoy the most. So I'd, I'd like to think that m my colleagues feel the same way. Dude, it's everything. You know, the best way to continue to build your workforce is keep the great employees that you have. You know, if you're churning 20%, it's hard to keep, uh, keep it moving in the right direction. Right. And one of the things we're really proud of is, you know, we didn't shut during COVID. I mean, we had the challenges that every manufacturer had in terms of supply chain, but there was no period in time that we had to shut the factory down. We really, you know, kept on slot and our, our team were fantastic. So what else is in the future? You know, you've got, you've made a huge dent in the defibrillator market, but it sounds like you got some more growth there. And ARM, are those really the big focus for defib tech in the I years I think ahead? ARM's going to be a game changer. It, you know, adoption, I mean, if we think we're 30% penetrated in the AD market, there's still a lot of runway for us to do much better there and for all our colleagues and peers in the industry to do that. I mean, there's, there's, there's enough opportunity for everybody to really uh, fill that gap. And, you know, we've had a lot of help from um, the Connecticut um, uh, Democratic Caucus of Rosa DeLora and, and uh, Dick Blumenthal and um, Paul Lavoie and, and people like that have been very supportive to us. So if we can keep um, a focus at a, at a government perspective to drive bills, I think the AD market, um, you know, government are going to spend a lot of money. Let's get them putting ADs in in federal buildings. Let's, you know, as we do these infrastructure projects like train stations, transportation, let's make sure that, you know, we're, the people riding those are protected. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think for automated chest compression, we'd love to see that uh, go the next level down for first responders, whether it's policemen in the back of cruisers or, you know, in, in perhaps in, in, in other areas. So and I think as well, one of the things we're really excited about is we're trying to disrupt that market. It's a very expensive piece of kit and we're trying to engineer the arm, the arm is well, generally the, the, because the defibrillator, I mean, it's not it's not fifty bucks, but it's I mean, it's it's a it's well within reach of any office building. Well, exactly, and there's a lot of payment program. I mean, a lot of our partners will work with you, so it's just really a monthly subscription. But for ARM, for you know, the fire departments like the Metro fire departments, like FDMY, you know, San Francisco, Cal Fire, Texas, all of those places, they're covered pretty well. But when you get out to you know, West Hartford, I'm sure, is a, is a place where you've got, you know, maybe a blended fire department, some volunteers and some professional firefighters. I, I don't know that for I sure. It's professional the whole town, but I get your but, meaning. But for the more, for where money's a little tighter, where the municipalities are paying for it, they really only have one or two solutions for automatic chest compression units. And um, the market leader of who of Stryker, who are very worthy competitive of ours and have a fantastic product, um, it's an it's very expensive, so we're trying to make sure that we position our product as more affordable, so that the smaller um, users can get access to it. I think it's a great idea. You know, the, there's no doubt that kind of the t the work that it takes to do CPR and probably even more so for high quality CPR, it's it's engaging. I mean, it's something you really got to put some effort into. And if you're doing that on a regular basis, I can only imagine repetitive injury and or the inability to sort of deliver over a period of time, like that quality chest compression over and over again. So having a machine to do that for you just seems like a really, really good idea if you can get it in a way that's reliable and affordable, right? Well, exactly. And that's exactly why that's a focus. And we hope to expand that product portfolio. So we're making more products in that space, in the pre-hospital space and in Bramford as well, in Connecticut and, and um, you know, supplying them all around the world. There we go. Well, listen, no offense to your home uh, heritage there, but go USA manufacturing, right? Absolutely. <laughs> well, Joe, listen, it's been really, really awesome uh, having you on the show. I'm wondering if I'm going to flip you over to some uh, final questions here as we yeah, round it sure. out. All right. So here's a quick question for you. If you had to do something other than be the senior vice president at DefibTech, what would you do to spend your time? Money's no object. Anything I'd in the just whole play world. I cars, Ari, all day long. What kind of cars? Old cars. Oh, you're like an old car? Yeah, I, am, I, I like my vintage German cars. <laughs> I, I, nice. I definitely have a serious car problem. <laughs> very nice. Do you have a favorite business book? Yeah, I think I do. I, I'm very, well, I probably have two. I, I particularly enjoy Malcolm Gladwell. And um, I find Blink a great book, but I also, uh, I, and I'm going to murder the title of this, but talking to people, he has a, 
uh, I'm losing the, the the title, but it's really the importance of the words that you pick when you when you engage people in a conversation. Well, the, the importance of the words is very very important. Joe, what's something that you learned early in your life or early in your career that you think's helped propel you to all the success that you've had? Well, I think relationships are much more important than being right. And I think if you can find a way to collaborate with people and find some common ground, um, you can get a lot further. And, uh, you know, people do business with people they like. No question about that. What's something that you've learned later in life or later in your career that if you could go back and tell young Joe, and if young Joe would listen to you, it would have a real positive impact on his life? Well, so somebody told me this, and I'll share this with, uh, with your listeners. And, and so, you know, at 20, you want a job. At 30, you want experience. At 40, you want power. At 50, you want paid. And at 60, you want to get out, which I always thought is quite, quite interesting. But if I could go back to younger Joe, I think I would say that to be successful, certainly as a manager, you know, you've got to realize that, that it's empowering people and teaching people is much more valuable. That's how you, if you yourself want to get further, you, you're, you're much more likely to do that by have, surrounding yourself with very good people and, and empowering them to be successful. I cannot agree with you more. Empowering those around you really is the secret to success. If there is a secret, that's definitely it. Joe, thank you so, so very much for coming on today. Really appreciate hearing about you and Defib Tech. Very, very exciting stuff. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks, Harry. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by Compass MSP. Thanks for listening and spending some time with me today. My goal is to help build a strong manufacturing community, and it would be impossible to do without all of you.